KSN's Motoring 95 is brought to you by Quaker State. Quaker State, the intelligent oil for longer engine life. And Midas, for brake, exhaust, suspension, and steering service, trust your car to Midas. This week, Motoring 95 is at a party, a party that many thought could never take place. Hello, everybody. You know, it wasn't that long ago that German luxury car makers like Mercedes-Benz and BMW would never hear of having one of their vehicles built outside of the homeland. Well, my, how things have changed. In South Carolina, BMW is a household name in some households who have never seen a BMW. And there's reason for that. You see, BMW has just built their very first production plant in North America, and it is here in Spartanburg, South Carolina. And they are throwing this party to celebrate what is an historic event, as BMW, for the first time in their history, will have Americans building their cars with good old German know-how. It was a party that South Carolina would not soon forget. After an initial list of 250 possible sites, BMW had chosen Spartanburg as a location for its brand new $400 million production facility. It is assembling the entry-level 318 sedan. The 325 will be added late in 95, followed by the long-awaited roadster that will be exclusive to Spartanburg. The workforce, referred to as associates, was hired from within a 50-mile radius of Spartanburg. The plan had 570 jobs available and they received close to 65,000 applications. BMW's the bread and butter right now in the upstate. It is exciting because you come out here and you see what some company has decided to put here and you just wonder why and they tell you it's because of the good education and the pro-business climate and you know a lot went on behind the scenes. It's really exciting. It's the biggest business story we've had in the last four or five years here. From a business standpoint, it was a good deal for BMW. Plenty of tax breaks, cheaper labor force than in Germany. But, and it's a big but, how will the market respond to a BMW made in America? There's certainly, as you said, there's a risk in, in any investment of, of this size. But I think that when you look at vehicle production today and its, its totality, Vehicles are produced other places in the world than their specific country of origin. Uh, Japanese cars aren't necessarily produced in Japan. American cars aren't necessarily produced in America. And you know, German cars don't have to be produced in Germany. It's the, the brand that's behind the car that starts to become the uh, driving factor. It's a risk in, certainly in, in market acceptance, but we've analyzed the market, what we believe to be, carefully and also with a uh, uh, a bit of, uh, let's say, outlook to the future to see where people are moving and what's happening and what type of changes are taking place. Both Mercedes and BMW have realized that North America is a major market in the world. And you have to compete there. It's uh, 12 or 12 million cars, and, and that's where we have to be in order to be successful. Al Kinser was the first American management person hired by Honda when it came to North America. And today, he's the man in charge of the South Carolina BMW plant. He's been in the business for 25 years and admits the workplace has changed considerably. Today, he works in an open concept. Assembly lines work in teams, and business suits are taboo. Sure, change has been all throughout uh, the sector of manufacturing, and I, I would say it's been more of an evolutionary process than it has been revolutionary. But uh, my philosophy in this kind of a system fits right into what I believe. I have a lot of faith in people and the human beings uh, that they can and will perform. We're looking for people who take pride in their work, who can work as individual teams, who contribute more than their physical anatomy. They can contribute their mind and their efforts and their brain. And they can understand the competitiveness that we operate in today in our kinds of markets and they had to be willing to learn and of course willing to accept in some cases our kind of philosophy. 
probably in respect to the kind of product that we're producing, we probably are uh, lacking a bit in the terms of automation. But we think that's our strength. We work through people first. We can always get automation. Anybody can buy robots. The majority of the work is, is hand-built. Uh, they're doing that to help us understand exactly how this car is put together. They do have intentions of, of uh, increasing the automation in this plant. But bottom line is we need to learn exactly how the car is put together before we can turn it over to, to the robots. That way we're going to have a better understanding of what the robots are supposed to be doing. And we're hand building, assembling now, but we're going to be responsible for all these robotic stations later on. First month that we were here, they sent us to Germany to train uh, as understudies under the German trainers who are artists and craftsmen um, in their own realm. We hope to be as good as they are someday. We're still in a bit of a, a learning curve, but they tell us that we're getting much better. It's a car that's made by BMW. It's a car that's engineered by BMW. And whether that car is engineered and, and made in South Carolina or engineered and made in, in Munich, Dingelfing, or any of our Regensburg plants, it's the same car. Uh, it's certainly built by a different uh, team of people with a different culture, but they all develop the BMW culture. And that's why when the car comes out, it'll have stampings on it that say, made by BMW. And when we put that rondelle on our products, it doesn't matter where it's manufactured. It raises expectations for customers, but also raises expectations for ourselves as an organization of what that product is when it rolls out of the door, whatever factory it's rolling out and whatever street it's rolling onto. It bears a BMW stamp when it's going down the road, and we have to know that the customers and the owners who are driving that, and the prospects and clients who hope to drive it in the future, uh, we can satisfy the level of expectation. You're looking at the very first 318 produced here at the BMW plant in Spartanburg, South Carolina. Now remember those other 318s we saw on the assembly line earlier in the program? Well, later on I've got a very sad story to tell you about those cars. I mean, I'm talking sad. In fact, this story is so sad you may want to have a handkerchief ready and that includes our own Bill Gardner back at the garage. Fred, you don't notice too many mechanics carrying around handkerchiefs or Kleenexes. If there's any crying to be done, it'll probably be done in the shirt sleeves of these coveralls. That's one of the reasons we wear them. I got it figured you're going to tell me the price of that BMW, and that'll probably get me to crying. Anyhow, this week I want to talk about starter motors, that little electric motor that lives underneath your engine and cranks over that great big engine on a really cold morning with relative ease. Now here's the location of the starter motor in most vehicles. There is the odd vehicle where you can see the starter motor from the underhood area, but in most cases you're going to be underneath the vehicle like we are right now in order to view the starter motor. Now in just about all cases they're bolted to the engine or transmission right where the engine and transmission intersect because the starter pinion, the small gear inside the starter, has to mesh with this great big ring gear that we refer to uh, that is on the flex plate or flywheel of the engine. Now those two mesh when you turn the key and it allows the starter motor to crank the engine over. Now I've uh, hooked up a jumper wire to this starter motor so that I can get it to crank uh, from underneath here and that's what's going to happen when you turn the key in the morning. Starter pinion intersects with this ring gear, cranks the engine over. Now I've moved the, the uh, inspection cover aside so that you could see this area here and that's exactly what happens when you crank that thing over in the morning. Here's the typical starter motor we've, we've removed from the car, mounted in the vise, and I've hooked it up to a battery over here via some booster cables. Now when I hook up my jumper wire to this one, you're going to see the starter motor engage. That's what it would do in the car. The starter pinion kicks forward and engages with this area here where our, where our flywheel is located, and it would begin to crank the engine over. Now in order to do that, the solenoid up here has a lot to do with that. It, it not only electrically connects the uh, battery to the starter motor, but in this case it also mechanically kicks the starter drive into engagement with the flywheel. Now in most cases the, the uh, solenoid is either integral or mounted on the starter in this fashion, with the exception of Ford products which are mounted remotely on the fender. 
Now, down inside the front of the starter here is this assembly here we refer to as the drive or pinion assembly. There's the pinion gear meshing with the flywheel, and there's an overrunning clutch in this assembly that allows it to freewheel in one direction and lock up in the other, so that if you accidentally forget to or release the key once the engine's going, you won't overspeed and destroy the starter. Now, in this area here, the starter motor is basically just a 12-volt DC electric motor with brushes, bushings, field coils, etc. Everything you'd expect to find in an electric motor. Now next week I want to show you a little bit different slant on starter motors and that's what we refer to as a gear reduction starter that's allowed engineers some flexibility in a couple of areas. Till then, I'm Bill Gardner for Motoring 95. Off-Road Corner with Cam McRae. Brought to you by Land Rover. Makers of Range Rover, Discovery and Defender. Too often overlooked, your tires are your 4x4's only connection with the planet. Four little contact patches, no bigger than a man's hand. Inside that contact patch, blocks and edges and sipes have to grab onto the universe and hold your 4x4 down to it, crawling forward. As you might expect, the more aggressive the tire, the better off you're going to be off-road. Got a couple of used tires here. Tires that came off four-wheel drive vehicles. As you can see, this one's a really mild tire. This one's slightly more aggressive. This one is a true mud and snow all-season radial tire. This one on the right-hand side is a really rugged, true off-road tire. What's the best tire for you? If you want to maintain a multi-purpose vehicle, Choose something like this one. Good aggressive tread, lots of traction for mud and snow. But the real experts, they get four spare wheels and buy four of these and save them for off-roading. They don't use them for anything else. Why? Because the rule of thumb is you never go off-road with a tire that's more than half worn. Save these and you'll always have them sharp for off-roading. Here's a little gadget that'll help you tell if your tires are more than half gone. You can obtain this at any auto parts store. It's a tread depth gauge. The tread depth gauge has a little plunger. You push down into the tire to read the depth. Reset it, place it over a gap, and push it down between the tread blocks. Pull it out and you can read the tread depth right off the gauge. Your local tire dealer can give you the original specifications for the tread depth on your tires. Your Land Rover Canada Tread Lightly Tip of the Week. A spinning tire is an ineffectual tire and it's an environmentally unfriendly tire. It claws at the environment and it can get you stuck. Keep your throttle really light and easy. It'll get you home more safely and Mother Nature will thank you for it. For the Off-Road Corner, I'm Cam McRae. Test Drive with Graham Fletcher. The subject to this test drive is the all new Volvo 960, their new flagship. Now, while a skid pad is not exactly the place you'd expect to find a station wagon, this is no ordinary family wagon. The 960's fully independent suspension was largely taken from Volvo's hugely successful 850 model. Up front there are McPherson struts complete with an anti-roll bar. An additional new cross member links the left and right frame rails which stiffens up the front end immensely. The rear suspension uses Volvo's patented multi-link rear design with a single transversely mounted composite leaf spring. The whole lot is bolted to a new aluminum subframe. This helps with stiffness as well as reducing the amount of road noise transferred to the body. Worthy of note is the fact that this is the first time the 960 wagon has shared the same suspension as the sedan. That's the techie stuff. As far as performance is concerned, the ride quality is exceptionally good given the European firmness. In the handling department, the 960 is quite simply second to none. Indeed, during the pylon test, I almost forgot that this was a family wagon. 
Spirited steering inputs yield quick responsive turn-ins. Many other manufacturers could take a page from Volvo's book when it comes to suspension design. The low-profile 15-inch Michelin MX V4s round off a very well-balanced package. Under the hood of the new 960 is a reworked version of the 3-litre 24-valve twin cam found in the previous model. For 95, output is rated at 181 horsepower and 199 pounds-feet of torque. In reworking the engine, Volvo have moved more of the usable torque into the low and mid-ranges which improves throttle response throughout the operating range. During the test, the 960 proved to be a willing performer, accomplishing the 0 to 100k dash in just under 9.5 seconds. Matched with this engine is an advanced 4-speed automatic that offers three different driving modes, Sport, Normal and Winter. The first two are obvious, the latter locks the transmission in third gear, which helps cut down on the amount of wheel spin when pulling away on snowy surfaces. This 960 is a rear-wheel drive vehicle and yet for some strange reason it is not offered with traction control. The irony in all of this is that the front-wheel drive 850 does come with traction control. I say irony because traction control is far more effective in a rear-wheel drive vehicle like this than it is in a front-wheel drive car. Stopping power is provided with a four-wheel disc brake system that comes complete with a standard three-channel Bosch anti-lock system. To prevent brake fade, the front rotors are ventilated and the brake fluid routed such that it does not pass the rotors, thereby minimizing the risk of overheating. For the record, the 960 required 118 feet to stop from 80k. Inside, the 960 is offered one way and that is loaded. Standard equipment includes power locks, windows and mirrors, eight-way power seats for both front passengers that include bottom warmers and a three-position memory for the driver's seat. You'll also find cruise control and a power moonroof. The dash is analog and easily interpreted, featuring a rarity in many of today's cars, and that is a large clock with hands. The automatic climate control uses large rotary dials, meaning they're easy to operate, even with gloves on. The only knock from an ergonomic standpoint is that the radio sits a little low in the dash. Factor in the number of buttons and you inevitably have to look at it to operate it. Now that's a no-no given this car's punch. The rear environment is spacious, offering plenty of head and leg room. This car will also accommodate three across the back in relative comfort. The other item worthy of note is the built-in child seat. With the seats folded down, this Volvo will carry everything, including the kitchen sink. Even with the seats up, there's still an enormous amount of trunk space, but the thing I really like, there's a lockable storage space beneath the cargo floor. That way you can keep your valuables secure and away from prying eyes. On the safety front, the 960 scores very well again, featuring dual airbags, ABS, three-point seat belts in all positions, including the center seat position, plus Volvo's patented side impact protection system. This system is designed to absorb the energy of a side impact through structural members in the floor, sills, pillars, roof and doors rather than allowing them to concentrate on the impact zone. Well that wraps up the test drive on the Volvo 960. The highlights of this vehicle are its practicality, versatility, the handling characteristics and overall performance. The downside is the lack of traction control. In winter, that's an option that this vehicle could very well do with. Our Midas tip of the week deals with hesitation, stumble and stalling. Three pretty common drivability problems with many of today's vehicles. Now if your car exhibits any of those situations, the first thing you should suspect is a problem with its heated air intake system. All carbureted cars and many fuel injected vehicles as well use some form of a system to preheat the air entering the air cleaner. Here's the flex hose that brings the hot air up from the exhaust manifold. It connects to that port right there. It's an elbow that comes into the base of the air cleaner. Now in the air cleaner snorkel, you can see a damper flap and I'm going to close it right now. There's the closed position. In this position it blocks off all cold air from entering here and, and draws all the intake air through this heated portion right under here. Now inside the air cleaner housing is an ambient sensor located in here that senses the air inlet temperature and regulates the position of this damper. Anywhere from a mid position like that to fully closed or a fully open position as it would be on a hot summer's day. 
Now there's also an ambient sensor involved in this system, some vacuum hoses and other plumbing, and any of it can and will fail. If your car exhibits any of those three situations, suspect this system first. If you want to make a quick check of this system yourself, start the car from a cold start, and after five or six minutes, keep your hand in this area here on the air cleaner snorkel directly behind the damper assembly. It should start to get lukewarm if the system's working properly. If it's not, repair this before you do anything else. That's probably the source of your stumble, hesitation, or stall. That's your Midas tip of the week. The ultimate German driving machine, built by rednecks? That's coming up next on Kenzie's Corner. Kenzie's Corner with Jim Kenzie. Are Canadian car buyers ready to accept luxury German sedans imported from South Carolina? Well, BMW says the quality is going to be the same as it is in Germany. Yeah, that's what Volkswagen said about their plant in Pennsylvania, which closed in 86, and about their current plant in Mexico. Now, a couple of pre-production cars were on display at the factory yesterday. Car 49, frankly, wasn't very good. The panel gaps were wide and the doors weren't on straight. Car number 150 was much better. And I suspect by the time you can buy a 318 four-door sedan in early 1995 that was built in this plant, it'll look pretty much the same as any other. But here's a warning to BMW. South Carolina cars are going to have to be better than German cars, not just equal. And I'll tell you why. If the slightest problem happens with one of these cars, the owner is for sure going to blame it on the fact that the car was built by southern fried chicken eating rednecks and not by those Bavarian craftsmen. Never mind that the problem could easily happen to a German car and that those Bavarian craftsmen are likely to be Turkish guest workers. Now BMW is being clever in making this plant the sole source of their new Roadster based on the 3 Series. No other plant will be building this car, so there'll be no other plant to compare the quality to. But it's also a huge risk for BMW because the worldwide reputation of this Roadster will be based on how well the residents of this town can build them. Now I own a German-built BMW. Would I buy a South Carolina car? Well, frankly, I'd probably take my own advice and wait for a year or so. But then again, I've not driven that new Roadster. I'm Jim Kenzie. Well, the opening ceremonies have wrapped up here at the brand new BMW plant in South Carolina. And now it's time to tell you that sad story I promised you. Now, remember those 318s we saw on the assembly line earlier? Are you ready for this? None of them will get to experience the open highway. They will all be totaled, crunched, destroyed, up to 300 brand new cars. The reason? This is a training period, and BMW wants to make sure the workers or the associates have it down perfect before consumers get into the new vehicles. But there is a happy ending to this very sad story. All the vehicles will be recycled and come back as brand new BMWs. So there you go. That's it for this week. We'll see you next week for more stories about cars and people who drive them. Motoring 95 is proud to introduce the first in a series of comprehensive test drive videos with an exclusive comparison of the seven most popular minivans in North America. Graham Fletcher evaluates performance, versatility and safety. Bill Gardner examines each van top to bottom, front to back and under the hood. Jim Kenzie covers showroom savvy, the demonstrator, buying or leasing, options and much more. We'll also compare fuel economy, safety features, warranties, replacing parts, and recall history. For your copy of this exclusive video, send check or money order to Motoring 95, P.O. Box 65213, Toronto, Ontario, M4K 3Z2, or call 1-800-340-7607. 416 and 905 area codes call 416-462-1504. TSN's Motoring 95 is brought to you by Quaker State. Quaker State, the intelligent oil for longer engine life. And Midas, for brake, exhaust, suspension, and steering service, trust your car to Midas.